Entonces, bueno, voy a, voy a simplificar. Yo vengo ahora de San Sebastián, donde tuve lugar el Congreso Internacional de Ontología, ya hemos cumplido 25 años, era la 13 edición, cuyo tema era este año ahí física y filosofía. Y hay que reconocer que estaba lo mejorcito de la física mundial. El presidente de honor era Franz Fassenberg, famoso por el que se llama Bosón de Higgs, pero que de hecho es el Bosón y el campo de Braut, Engler, Higgs, por este orden casi de, 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 de jerarquía, puesto que Braut no fue premio Nobel porque se murió. Y celebramos un congreso en el cual tenemos el orgullo de decir que estaba lo mejorcito de la física mundial, hablando de todas las cosas de la física de Aristóteles. Eso creo que no hay precedentes. Se clausuró con un debate un debate con, eh, yo, eh, con Carlos Rovelli sobre la física de Aristóteles eh, en un congreso que podríamos llamar de metafísica. Bien, este congreso se celebra durante, como digo, desde hace muchísimos años. Este año era física y ontología y esto es simplemente por qué esta sección de aquí hoy en particular. Bueno, simplemente porque antes de, de nuestro congreso eh, había habido el Congreso Mundial de Filosofía de Pekín en el cual se estaba debatiendo algo muy importante que yo creo que todavía puedo volver sobre ello, pensaba volver tras la conferencia o tras la intervención del profesor Escarantino. Bueno, pues, ¿por qué? Porque efectivamente había, creo que 9.000 eh, escritos, eh, 9.000. Yo hice un artículo para el diario El País y pensaron, que se publicó hace un, como 5 o 6 domingos, y me acuerdo que me dijeron, no quieres quiere decir 900. Es decir, que me había dije, no, 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 son efectivamente 9.000 filósofos en Pekín. Que, por cierto, el profesor Escalantini hizo una conferencia inaugural en la, en la Casa del Pueblo, ¿no? En el, en el, y allí se debatía algo que es muy importante para la cultura universal. El tema que se debatía en Pekín era aprendiendo a ser humano lo cual era un guiño a que de alguna manera se consideraba que la filosofía es eh, no un aprendizaje, no es una, dijéramos, como se suele decir usualmente, muy a menudo, con una cierta retórica, es una invitación a aprender a morir, siguiendo la, la alusión a, a, a Ferón y a la muerte de Sócrates, sino, una, al contrario, una, una invitación a aprender a vivir, ¿eh? a aprender a vivir humanamente. ¿Y qué quiere decir vivir humanamente? Pues evidentemente responder una cosa que en cualquier caso, si discutiría o no, yo no le voy a hablar la palabra al profesor Escarantino. Eh, vamos a ver, hay los que de aquí sean helenistas, si alguno lo es, pues servirá de mí, pero vamos, hay las, lo esencial de la filosofía está, sigue en cualquier caso en el arranque de las primeras páginas de los libros llamados Metafísica de Aristóteles, que dice que Pantes, Anthropoito, Eidenei, Oregon, Trae, Fisei, todos los humanos por genuina disposición, por naturaleza, en su esencia, en su especificidad, de su condición de animales, está el simbolizar y conocer. De tal manera que un ser humano que no simboliza y conoce, pues está, eh, de alguna manera, mutilando o renunciando a su condición específicamente humana. ¿Qué ocurría? Que todos, evidentemente, los que estábamos ahí reunidos en Pekín, veíamos en la filosofía prácticamente eh, como el paradigma de esta... Mm, inclinación del ser humano a la simbolización y al conocimiento. Lo que ocurre es que la palabra filosofía se equivoca. Obviamente se equivoca. Yo recuerdo que efectivamente, eso sí discutía en Pekín, eh, el profesor Escarantino empezó allí con, también diciendo que hay Aristóteles, por una otra también está Confucio. Entonces eso crea un auténtico problema al cual se puede debatir. ¿Es la filosofía universal antropológico como lo es la música, por ejemplo? Es decir, no hay pueblo sin música, es imposible. No, se puede, no hay por qué discutir eso ahora. Es imposible no porque ningún antropólogo haya constatado la existencia de una comunidad humana sin música, sino porque eh, algunas de las notas esenciales de la música son esenciales al lenguaje y por consiguiente hablar de un pueblo sin música, de una comunidad humana sin música, sería exactamente igual a hablar como una comunidad humana sin lenguaje. Pero entonces la pregunta, ¿es la filosofía en universal antropológico de tal manera que habría una modalidad de filosofía eh, que mm, sería específica de China, otra de Irán, otra de, de los pueblos del Bajo Nilo y otra de la Grecia de Jonia, con los tales de Mileto. Bien, en ese caso la filosofía sería un universal antropológico. O bien la filosofía es una cosa que nace en Grecia. En determinados momentos, en función de que en Grecia ocurre algo muy grave, o muy, bueno, muy grave en el sentido de, de, de dramático, en el sentido de radical, en el siglo V antes de Cristo, con los personajes de Thales nace la física y en consecuencia la metafísica, y dentro de la metafísica una modalidad de moral, de ética, de teoría del conocimiento, de estética, etc. Esto era un problema que se debatía efectivamente, implícitamente en peso. Y por eso ese congreso creo que tenía un gran peso en ese sentido. 
Entonces, bueno, yo le paso, paso la palabra a Lucas Carantino, a toda la que ha hecho el esfuerzo, porque él es responsable de la CISPA ahora en estos momentos y por consiguiente está uno a otro. Entonces, el que está aquí dos horas, está aquí dos horas y ha llegado de, de Berlín, pero es que ni, 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 ni tomo una copa, por así decirlo, se tiene que marchar inmediatamente y es muy de agradecer que hayan hecho el esfuerzo de, 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 de estar hoy aquí con nosotros. Muchísimas gracias, Víctor. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias a los colegas de Instituto Confuso. I'm going to speak English, uh, but I will say a few words to start in Spanish. Uh, yo tenía planeado empezar con tres disculpas. La primera por haber llegado tarde, y, pero bueno, parece que llegué a tiempo, justo. Entonces, pero hubo un atraso del avión y, y no, eso no se puede. La segunda sí, porque voy a tener que salir, irme un poco más temprano que lo previsto porque tenemos un avión a, alrededor de nueve y media y el tercer, el ter, la, la tercera razón de disculpar es que voy a hablar en inglés y no sabía exactamente cómo armar esto pero yo creo quiero respetar un poco a todas las sensibilidades lingüísticas e incluso las de nuestros colegas y me hubiese encantado hablar en español o hablar en catalán pero eh, no manejo todos estos idiomas. Entonces pensé que, como en el programa había una autorización a hablar en inglés, me parecía mucho más este, respetuoso y eh, oportuno utilizar este idioma. Pero bueno, si hay alguna discusión, algún debate, encantado de hablar en un castellano con acento italiano. Bueno, entonces, dear friends, dear colleagues, Thank you very much for putting up this nice event, nice day. Uh, I will start saying that it's certainly a privilege and a pleasure and a honor to be here and to present some considerations about the relevance of the World Congress of Philosophy, the Congress of Mundial Philosophia, that took place in Beijing a few weeks ago. Let me say immediately that uh, there were certainly many reasons and very timely reasons to hold the World Congress of Philosophy in China today. Uh, Victor mentioned the amazing number of participants. The Congress lasts nine full days and over these nine full days thousands and thousands of scholars and students to an unprecedented extent in the history of World Congresses. This was the largest ever doesn't mean it was the best, but it was certainly the largest ever. Thousands of students, scholars and students from all over the world debated on current trends in philosophy, discussed the classics of thought, presented our philosophical traditions under the common theme, learning to be human, aprender a ser humano. They imagined new forms of cross-cultural integration in philosophy and through philosophy. Out of hundreds of panels, out of myriad scholarly and personal connections, are like uh, uh, hundreds of joint academic programs, PhD, and other academic amenities are likely to come into being. Think, for instance, of joint publications and similar things. It is reasonable to predict that as an effect of this Congress, the geography of the world philosophical community is being transformed and actually is already being transformed. This is something that changes everything in the dynamic of philosophy worldwide. I think we'll see very soon in the way how people do philosophy. Nonetheless, it is not only about academic connections. Something deeper than academic networking was at stake in Beijing something that involves the scope and the boundaries of philosophy. Today, a growing number of colleagues, of scholars, of philosophers across the world show an increasing attraction to themes, to ideas, even to styles of other philosophical traditions. They, we, look to deconstruct well-established boundaries in our own disciplines, be it philosophy or other disciplines in the humanities at least. The Congress of Ontology is a good example of how disciplines may merge, may come together in dealing with a particular 
team. Colleagues across the world care for bringing to the fore intersectional forms of exclusion and eventually eradicate them. An intense sensitivity for inclusiveness and diversity seems to characterize contemporary scholarship and philosophy, be it cultural diversity or, for instance, gender diversity. In, the, in this context, in this changing context, we have perceived over the last years a growing awareness that what we usually call philosophy is dramatically defective without the intellectual legacy of Chinese philosophy, culture, and spirituality. When I was a student last century, we used to have 10 volumes of history and philosophy. And what was impressive for us was that the nine volumes, nine and a half, were about the history of Western philosophy. And the last 50 pages of the 10 volumes was philosophy in the rest of the world, which include China, India, Japan, whatever. All together over there. This is no longer possible. No. So in our view, we thought that it was time for the international philosophical community to give once and for all proper value and recognition to the contribution of Chinese philosophy to ancient, modern, and contemporary thought, to acknowledge its distinctive cultural relevance in our scholarly work and in our academic duties, and to extend, through China, the same pattern of recognition to other conceptual, <coughs> spiritual, and scientific systems in all continents. It's not just about opening philosophy to China. It's opening philosophy to China, to India, to Japanese philosophical tradition, to the philosophical tradition of Africa, think of Ubuntu philosophy, to the philosophical and spiritual heritage of South America, of Mesoamerica, of Southeast Asia, and essentially make philosophy a really universal endeavor, able to speak to readers and to audiences and to colleagues all across the world. Victor just said that philosophy, was it born in Greece or not? Uh, it might have been born in Greece. I think we can agree about that. But it's becoming controversial. But let's say it is the case. Let's say philosophy was actually Greek and level. But nonetheless, we find it all over the continent. We cannot say that because, we, I think we can no longer say that because it does it is not Greek, then it is not philosophy. Um, and what I think we might adopt as a new point of view is maybe starting thinking that the spread of philosophy beyond the boundaries of the ancient Mediterranean world has been a much earlier fact than we ever thought of. Maybe we can start thinking that if we find things that have a philosophical content and philosophical method and philosophical styles out of Greece, out of Rome, out of essentially the Mediterranean, in the very first centuries before Christ. It's because there were many more exchanges that we have learned to think of. In any case, even if philosophy was born in Greece, it's very hard to say that Confucius is not philosophical. It's very hard to say that uh, Tao is not philosophical, Manchus is not philosophical. And it's true for many different traditions, I think, I believe. And I think this is the direction that the Congress is suggesting to take. Philosophy, therefore, as an understanding of the human in its historical existence, in its historical diversity, can no longer be confined to a particular conceptual horizon. We, not we, as scholars, as philosophers, as scholars in other disciplines, no longer write just for a local readership or even for a regional readership. We cannot think that we write for European readers. It's no longer possible, or even Euro-American ones. <laughs> An increased complexity and diversity of philosophical concepts is required to make sense of the social ethical and cultural complexity of our world. While creativity, imagination, historical awareness, feeling, learning, 
critical thinking, analysis are required to form new conceptual tools and philosophy, this effort also confronts us with a very sensitive theme, which is the reappraisal of the nature of philosophy and its relations with other forms of spirituality, of religion, and of science. Because of this inclusiveness, and because of its enormous scholarly influence, the World Congress in China represented a historical opportunity for reassessing the sense of philosophy, for enhancing the theoretical diversity of philosophical concepts, and for rethinking in widely comprehensive ways the notion of being human, or of becoming human. So, these are just some of the reasons why the International Federation of Philosophical Society and possibly the scholarly communities across the world at large poured so much effort in this historical congress. It took five years to organize it. And I would like to express here and to tell you how admirable was the effort deployed by the Chinese organizing committee despite all possible difficulties you can imagine of all kinds. Nonetheless, their effort was absolutely admirable. They poured massive financial resources, massive, and a lot, a lot of human energy. Their effort, actually our joint effort, certainly enabled us to finally revise the canon of our discipline, and thereby reshaping the philosophical terrain at, at large. And it certainly gave the scholarly communities of the world, our colleagues all across the world, a unique opportunity to overcome existing prejudices and stereotypes across cultures. Let me, take, let me mention an example that is not directly related to the Congress. Uh, you may know that every year there is an international contest or show or international party called the International Olympias of Philosophy. These are high school students from about 50, 60 different countries that meet in a different, different place every year and essentially write an essay in philosophy. The main um, requirement is that every student has to write an essay in a language that is not her or his <laughs> native language. So Spanish student may write in English, in French, but not in Spanish. Uh, uh, French students may write in Spanish, in English, in German, but not in French, and so on. So there are students from all over the world. These are kids who are 19, 18 years old. And amazingly, in the last years, winners are in their majority students from Asian countries. We have Korean, uh, South Koreans who win all the time. Last year we had Japanese, we had one Chinese, we had Indian, we had Thailand, all these students got medals in this contest. One of the, I've been in the jury, so I had an opportunity to read the essays, and what is impressive, of course we don't know who is right, okay, it's totally blind, we'll discover that later, but what is impressive is that these students do not just win because they are in a very hard teaching system, they are in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of school where they learn different cultural traditions. They know their own tradition, but they also know the Western one. So they are, in some way, trained to think in a, actually to develop more complex tools of analysis of the world. Uh, and this is impressive. It, we add uh, themes in topics of gender, in topics of com comment, commenting Aristoteles, commenting Kant, commenting other authors, they are perfectly able not just to handle the philosophical tradition of the West, but to understand the problems mentioned in the subjects with an extreme depth. And this has to do with the way how we in Europe, for instance, conceive our educational system. I have been involved in a kind of brainstorming team of the Minister of Education in Italy. And what is in, in, incredible is that there is essentially no learning of other traditions than ours. Uh, and this is a shortcoming for our kids. They 
learn very well what they have to learn, but they know nothing about the rest. So I think that the academic world, the academic communities, <coughs> scholars, but also teachers and also our educational system going down up down to the very early years of learning should probably take into account the fact that in the world where we are today there is a real need to form young generations in a cross-cultural way. It doesn't mean that they have to know everything about everything. It means that you may know your tradition better than you know other traditions, but must be able to put it in a wider historical context. It's very good to study Socrates and Plato, as we in Italy we have studied philosophy of three years in high school. It's a lot. And of course we know everything about Plato and Aristoteles and the pre-Socrats and, and everything in, in the ancient world. But nobody has ever taught us that while these things happened in Greece, other things happened in the rest of the world, like Buddha, like Confucius, like the Axial Age, and all these things. Um, so this is something that has an impact not just on research, not just on academia, but on the way how our learning systems are conceived and are structured. And I think it's a very, very important effect or uh, domain of work that we have before us for the next for the next years. It's not about Korean students winning the IPO. It's about Korean students and Asian students, in this case, being trained in a more comprehensive way than European ones. And this might become a problem in, in the next future. Anyway, I was saying this to kind of substantiate the idea that we, as scholars, and particularly as Western scholars in my case, should take all possible steps to increase the cross-cultural awareness of our high school students and academic and university students, starting from the very early stages of a child's education, as soon as possible. Our children, our students, can no longer know everything about Western literature, about Western history, philosophy, art, or other spiritual expressions of the Western world, whatever you may think of, and at the same time, ignore everything, or almost everything, about the literatures, philosophies, religions, arts, and above all, about the history of the rest of the world. We know, maybe not everything, but a lot, about Hesiod, Homer, the Orphic hymns. But what do we know of the Mesoamerican mythologies out of the specialized academic department. And if we want to go from our children to ourselves, how many European specialists of Fichte ever heard the name of Dasan? Have our children ever been exposed to the historical fact that while Greek classical culture flourished in the fifth century, <coughs> other classical cultures, no less important and influential than the Greek one, flourished in India and in China? So, if I had to draw a conclusion from the World Congress that took place in Beijing, I would certainly claim that after Beijing, all of this situation is about to change utterly. And essentially, in the case of Chinese philosophy, which is very well studied in the Department of Sinology, the idea is to take it out of the Department of Sinology and take it into the Department of Philosophy, to take them into the Department of History, and so on. Although a growing need for, for cross-cultural approaches to philosophy and to the humanities at large has been growing over the world, over the last years, and possibly over the last decades, this Congress, the Beijing one, seems to have publicly and irreversibly acknowledged this need. And in my view, after Beijing, nothing is as it was before. So let me add a final remark. In the particular situation that our European countries are today going through, whereas localism seems to be one of the new keywords, the tone and approaches shared in Beijing, communicated in Beijing, may play a revolutionary role. 
they may become a key intellectual attitude to resist, for those who want to resist at least, against the progressing loss of responsibility, of education, and of democratic, aware democratic awareness that is, in my view, the most dangerous flaw of our time here in Europe. Perhaps, with some chance, with some effort, with some luck, the impact of the Congress will not just be of academic or scholarly nature, but would have a wider social impact. Thank you. We must recall that the, the old Congress 10 years ago was also in Asia. The, the old Congress 10 years ago was also in Asia. Yes. The, in the World Congress in 2008 took place in Seoul, Korea, but it was not comparable to this. That was a Congress, I would say, as usual. It was a Congress that where Korean philosophical community essentially tried and successfully tried, tried to be involved in a very Western-like uh, philosophical play. They were very much uh, focusing on analytic philosophy. They were very much focusing on themes that belong to the classic canon of philosophy. And it was not very big, but that's a minor thing. This changes everything. This, look, a good friend of mine used a very familiar expression, and probably not very correct, but very effective expression. He said, this, this Congress is the coming out party of Chinese philosophy. And it's exactly what it was. The idea is to take Chinese philosophy out of the departments of sinology, for philosophers and make it part of the philosophical education at large. And this is something that has never been done before to this extent. I think that the trend or the, the wave is not reversible. I don't think that any of us nowadays can any longer do philosophy thinking who cares if there is a reference in Chinese philosophy. It's not possible anymore. It's not possible when you write something about physics, for instance, or the concept of nature, to think I study nature and my references are entirely within the Western philosophy or Western tradition. That's no longer possible. Uh, I think we are, actually we are already seeing it, but we are going to see it in a very, very powerful way in the next few years. And, and I cannot see how it can be reverted. But again, the idea is not just to have Western philosophy plus Chinese philosophy. It's also to, if I may, uh, use the outstanding intellectual heritage of China, the tremendous power of Chinese culture and Chinese heritage to open the idea of uh, the, to open the canon of philosophy to a plurality of traditions. That's, in my view, the idea. How can we? Uh, well, I don't know how philosophical this can be today, and how deep can I go into technicalities. But how can we work on contemporary epistemology in the sense of a heritage of Kant tradition without the heritage of pragmatism? This everybody knows. But how can we understand pragmatism without the Kyoto School? They developed it in an incredibly smart way. And the Kyoto School in Japan did it thanks to the Buddhist, to the Zen heritage. They didn't show it, it's hidden, but you can see it if you go deep into that. So you can see how a typical Western tradition got a very pow uh, intellectually powerful development thanks to a philosophic, philosophical group of authors that come from a completely different tradition, which is the Japanese Zen tradition. But they use the same language as James, the same language as Heidegger, same language as these two, uh, <coughs> and so translate, poured their own tradition into this language. 
This is something that cannot be ignored any longer. And I think our difficulty as Western scholars is that we know very little about the rest of the world because that's the history of Europe. We have wonderful specialists, basically in all fields. But as you say, how do we bring this knowledge out of the specialized departments and make them part of our general training? Or in the case of high school students and kids of their education. This is something that I think <coughs> we have to do. It's something that has been done in many other parts of the world for a long time already. So that's the, in my view, the, the meaning of this Congress in particular. It's not that the Congress decided all this, there is nothing like that, but it gave public recognition to something, to a trend that's been going on for time already. So it was really a timely meeting, and if Peking University and the Chinese organizers all together poured so much effort in this. It was not just because they wanted to establish academic connections with other universities. They already have them. They don't need a congress for that. It was because there was something very deep on the table, which is we, the philosophy as such can no longer be done without incorporating, including the Chinese philosophical tradition and even deeper, without recognizing Chinese intellectual tradition as a philosophical one. And this applies, look, when we had to uh, decide the sections of the Congress, one of the discussions was, of course, Confucian philosophy. Some people say, okay, let's put it because it's fair to our host. But what about Islamic philosophy? And many people say there is no such thing as Islamic philosophy. Sufism is not a philosophy. So one of the main points of discussion was, is Sufism a philosophy? I think it is. I think it has a very strong feel. But this is the kind of discussions that come out of these large meetings. If we start saying, that's not a philosophy period, it doesn't go very far. And one of the difficulties of philosophical reflection in the last decades is that it has been in trouble having a cultural, intellectual, social impact, cultural impact in a world that is no longer what it used to be. This is really a universal world. So how can philosophy match this world in which we are living, which we are living now? And by changing, it's by opening up. In fact, one of the most important candidates for, for organizing the next Congress was Tokyo. The capital. Yeah, the next World Congress will be in Australia. But the but yes. it was a yeah. candidate. Yeah. So. But they lost. So before I begin, I'd just like to say thank you to Dr. Rafael Bueno for inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure. Um, um, and it was, it's been really interesting to hear the previous talks. Um, I was at the World Congress uh, earlier this summer in Beijing, and some of what um, Dr. Scarantino has said has really resonated with me. And I'm sure you'll discover that in what I'm about to say, uh, a number of the ideas will be going back to what has already been said. Um, so since this session is about the roots of philosophy and science in China, uh, I thought I'd begin talking very, very briefly about the Yi Jing, uh, the book of changes, uh, which can be said to be uh, the root of Chinese philosophy. Uh, so the call of the Yi Jing, the Zhou Yi, is a divination text dated to the Western uh, Zhou period, roughly the uh, 11th to the 8th century BCE. And the Book of Changes can be said to be the earliest of the classical canons in China, and one that holds a fundamental place in the development of Chinese thought. It contains ideas such as uh, the yin-yang, 
uh, showing the interconnectedness of polar opposites, apparent polar opposites, and the wuxing, the five phases, used to describe uh, the relationship between phenomena. So, if you like, the Yi Jing provides some of the most fundamental ideas in thinking about the world, and ideas which permeate areas such as philosophy, medicine, and art, to name just a few. Um, but today, I would like to concentrate on the so-called master's texts from the Spring and Autumn and Warring States period in China, so that's uh, 8th century to 3rd century BCE, uh, before the unification of China by the Qin Emperor. So it was a period that underwent huge social upheaval and saw much fervent debate uh, in terms of how one should live and how society should be organized. And those periods, I think, sowed the seeds for what later became known as Confucianism, uh, Taoism, Moism, uh, and other so-called schools of thought. And I say what later became known, because the ascription of philosophical schools to that period is to a large extent um, anachronistic and reflects later concerns for classification. But sometimes it can be convenient to use those labels uh, as, far, uh, as far as we're aware of those uh, limitations. So in my presentation, I will first comment on the distinctive features of the Confucian Analects and the scenes, uh, the senses in which the analects might uh, be different from the kinds of uh, philosophy familiar to a Western audience. And I'll then address the issue of uh, the diversity of thought within Chinese philosophy, which does have um, important implications for how we go about comparing the Chinese and the Western traditions. And finally, I will end by highlighting some of the advantages of taking a comparative approach. Uh, to the study of philosophy. So, when I mentioned that I work on ancient Greek and Chinese philosophy, the Chinese figure that instantly springs to most people's minds is Confucius. And the legacy of Confucius for the Chinese tradition cannot be overstated. And after all, we're here in the Confucius Institute today. Um, so let's first turn to the um, Analects, or the Lun Yu in Chinese which is a multi-layered text that uh, purports to be a record of the sayings of Confucius, whose historical dates fall into the 6th uh, and 5th century BCE. Uh, many of the sayings are set in the conversational context, so we see Confucius in conversation with his disciples and with figures of power, discussing a variety of topics to do with ritual, morality, and good government. Now, is the Analects a philosophical work? This question has been raised in the context of discussing whether one can legitimately speak about Chinese philosophy rather than just Chinese thought. And some have proposed that because the Analects contains brisk sayings in the form of aphorisms, it can only be viewed as a piece of wisdom literature rather than philosoph a philosophical work. Well, it's certainly not philosophy as we have it in the analytic tradition. But neither, I think, should philosophy be defined according to the uh, features of analytic philosophy alone. The Analects contains wide-ranging discussions of, for example, what makes a virtuous person, how self-cultivation should be conducted, and what uh, good governance consists of. And all of these are important philosophical topics. Um, its ideas have had a formidable impact and also laid down the route for many extended philosophical discussions in the Chinese tradition. For sure, what we often find in the Analects are statements or prescriptions, but it is through contextualizing the Analects uh, and reading it as a whole, rather than extracting the odd saying and taking it at face value, that enables us to um, bring to light the many interesting features and the interlocking, interlocking themes so throughout the Analects, Confucius is seen um, as giving dif uh, different definitions or glosses of uh, terms, which someone coming from a Platonic or Aristotelian tradition might find incoherent or uh, conflicted. Uh, so let me illustrate with a few passages on Ren, which is one of the um, most important concepts in the Analects that's been variously translated as 
benevolence, goodness, or humaneness. And it's a quality that the Confucian gentleman is expected to accept, exemplify. So let's look at four passages one by one. Yan Yuan asked about Ren. The master said, restraining yourself and returning to the rites, that's rituals, constitutes Ren. If for one day you manage to restrain yourself and return to the rites, in this way you could lead the entire world back to Ren. The key to achieving Ren lies within yourself. How could it come from others? Zhong Gong asked about Ren, so this is another disciple of Confucius. The master said, when in public, behave as though you were receiving an important guest, and in your management of the common people, behave as if you were overseeing a great sacrifice. Do not impose upon others what you yourself do not desire. In this way, you will encounter no resentment in your public or private life. Sima Niu asked about Ren. The master said, the person of Ren is hesitant to speak. Hesitant to speak? Is that all there is to Ren? The master said, when being Ren is so difficult, how can one not be hesitant to speak? Uh, now, there's a recurrent idea in the Analects that one might not be able to live up to one's uh, own words. That's why you need to be cautious about what you're saying. And um, interestingly, Sima Niu, this disciple of Confucius, is known to be particularly loquacious. So you can see where Confucius is coming from here. Fan Shi asked about Ren. The master said, love others. So what we have here are um, four different replies to essentially the same question, what Ren is. Now, the compilers of the Analects clearly didn't consider it problematic to include all these varied responses. And indeed, I think these um, contrasting passages <laughs> open up a window for us to see what instruction is like from Master Ko, or rather how the Analects wishes to present, uh, represent its scenes of instruction. So rather than a single strict definition of what Ren consists of, um, what the student and the reader is expected to consider are different aspects of Ren, which add to the complexity of the idea. And we see here Confucius adapting his replies on the basis of the uh, personal circumstances and the dispositions of his interlocutors. And we, the reader, are expected to reflect on the multiple dimensions of this concept. I've heard the complaint that, unlike Socrates in the Platonic Dialogues, who keeps asking questions to get to the essence of things, Confucius merely pres prescribes. He's only interested in telling others what to do. But is that true? In fact, Confucius frequently asks others for their opinions and isn't disposed to fully disclose everything. And he has high expectations that his disciple will do some work and to think for himself. So let's look at this passage. The master said, I will not open the door for a mind that is not already striving to understand, nor will I provide words to a tongue that is not already struggling to speak. If I hold up one point of a problem and the student cannot come back to me with the other three, I will not attempt to instruct him again. And I think much of the um, general misunderstanding about Confucius and the, and the Analects um, stems from a lack of serious study of the text and the tradition, and also from adopting a viewpoint that's heavily influenced by the Western philosophic tradition. And it's an issue that I'll come back to uh, later on in the presentation. Now, as tempting as it might be to take Confucian values as representative of the Chinese tradition as a whole, it's worth bearing in mind that in early China, there was a plethora of philosophical movements and that Confucianism didn't gain its domin uh, dominant position until the Han Dynasty. And so I think if there is one take-home message about uh, classical philosophy in China, it is that it's hugely diverse. So if we look at those texts, um, it's very, very interesting to see just how different they are in many senses, how they're written in different styles and forms, uh, certainly not all philosophical texts um, in China are in the aphoristic form, like the Analects. Some do contain extended discussions. And how the views diverge, and how, indeed, some of the texts openly criticize um, other philosophical figures. And so, for example, in some, uh, in some passages, 
of the drunk <coughs> Confucius comes across as a figure to be mocked. And the drunk um, challenges the reader to reconsider his presuppositions about the world through many fables and came to be regarded as one of the foundational Taoist <coughs> texts. Uh, it's a really, really wonderful text with many stories contained in it. And to give another example, uh, the Xunzi, which is a text that's generally regarded as belonging to the Confucian tradition, argues against Mozi's position that music is wasteful. So Mozi believes that we should do away with music and ritual, whereas Xunzi uh, directly uh, opposes him on that view. And texts associated with the Confucian tradition place a strong emphasis on bringing up the child so that he's uh, well cultivated in a particular way. Uh, whereas the Laozi, otherwise known as the Dao De Jing, now this is a, a, another foundational Taoist text, it views the untainted state of infancy as the ultimate state of <coughs> uh, attainment. So a different vision of cultivation here. And indeed, the Laozi challenges polarizations uh, of opposites, such as strength and weakness, and is well known for its portrayal of water. So water appears to be weak, but it's actually a source of great strength. And its message for a sense of naturalism uh, that recognizes the simplicity and effortless action of artifice uh, has held a long-lasting influence on Chinese calligraphy and art. Uh, so, so far it's just been text, but I do have a couple of pictures here. This is a painting by uh, Ba Da Shanren from the Ming Dynasty, uh, 17th century, uh, early 17th century. And here we can see uh, he is much influenced by Taoist thought, and there's a real sense of simplicity and almost minimalism in the painting. Uh, this is a picture by the Song Dynasty painter Ma Yuan. We see uh, water being presented here. Uh, going back to the Laos, the image of water being a source of great strength. And we actually used a painting from Ma Yuan in this recently edited edition that I published with Professor Jeffrey Lloyd. Uh, it's a collection of essays on uh, the Greek and Chinese tradition. Uh, it just came out earlier this year. So we use this image of water that um, harks back to the uh, view of water in the Laozi, and also it um, suggests the merging of ideas from different cultural traditions flowing together into a sea of wisdom. So now, even within what we might label as Confucianism, there are contrasting viewpoints. Uh, so in a famous case, Mentius from the 4th century BC argues that human nature is good, that everybody possesses these four sprouts of goodness, that if we cultivate them correctly, they give rise to virtues. So for example, Mentius gives a very well-known example of a child that's about to fall into a well, and he says, well, everybody possesses uh, compassion, um, so that if they were about to see this child, they would uh, help to rescue it suggested that they would uh, rescue them without any concern for praise or uh, external reward of any kind. And that's a indication of the nascent goodness of human beings. And Xunzi, uh, on the other hand, explicitly criticizes Mencius' views and says that human nature is bad, that everybody is born with these um, selfish tendencies for personal profit and benefit, and that they, everybody needs to learn to moderate his desires through cultivation. And the extent to which these two philosophers are at odds with each other is a subject of debate. Um, but what is clear is that um, by means of criticizing others, we see these Chinese philosophers establishing themselves as figures of authority. So just as we can't speak of the Greek view uh, ancient Greek view of the self, of moral responsibility, of the good life, we can't speak of the Chinese view of such broad topics. And given the plurality and the diversity of thought, if we simply took one piece of evidence as representative of the whole tradition, we would easily end up reinforcing certain cultural stereotypes, which rather impedes 
mutual understanding. And here I quote the sinologist Paul Golden. If there is one valid generalization about China, it is that China defies generalization. Chinese civilization is simply too huge, too diverse, and too old for neat maxims. For every China is this or China does not have that thesis, one can always find a devastating counterexample, and usually more than one. Now, uh, let me give an example of a generalization that I've had to deal with in my own research on shame. Uh, there's a famous dichotomy, uh, some, of you, some of you might have come across it, that's the shame culture versus guilt culture dichotomy that was introduced by the anthropologist uh, Ruth Benedict in her study of Japan and was later um, associated with other traditions. So shame culture, one that's principally relied on inculcating a loss of faith in the agent to maintain order in society, is associated with ancient Greece and with Chinese society as a whole. And guilt culture is identified as one that <coughs> relied on the true recognition of wrongful behavior accompanied by repentance and is associated with the Judeo-Christian societies. <coughs> so through my own research on Aristotle and Xunzi on shame, so Xunzi, who we've already come across in the human nature debate, arguing human nature is sad, I illustrate that this um, shame culture versus guilt culture dichotomy greatly oversimplifies the study of the emotions and involves several assumptions, including the idea that shame and guilt are essentially mutually exclusive emotions that can be clearly distinguished from each other, as well as the idea that cultural traditions can be um, easily classified as belonging to either one or the other of the camps. And I found in my study of Aristotle and Xunzi plenty of evidence to suggest that both philosophers actually go to great lengths, although in different ways, to explain why it is that it's the moral disposition of the individual that matters, rather than approval, uh, seeking external approval. Uh, so even though we can't say that Aristotle represents uh, the Greek, ancient Greek tradition as a whole, or Xunzi represents the Chinese tradition as a whole. What's clear from this case is that denigrating um, the ancient Greek and Chinese traditions to the shame culture camp um, clearly reflects a prejudiced view of these societies. So let me conclude by pulling the threads together and briefly summarizing the benefits of, the, of adopting a comparative approach, in particular in the area of, of ancient philosophy. I hope to have illustrated with the Amalek's case that we come with our own assumptions of what philosophy is, and that it's through studying the multiplicity of philosophies within different cultural traditions that we become equipped with the knowledge um, of different forms of philosophy. So then comparison allows us to see that things can be done differently. Um, and that even the categories that we use are subject to modification. And the result is that we manage to step outside this box um, to reflect on what's distinctive about our own tradition and what we have in common with other traditions that we might have previously considered that's unique to us. And the ancient Greek and Chinese philosophers dealt with some of the most fundamental questions in life concerning human nature, moral behavior, government, social institutions, and the nature of reality. And all of these are questions that have contemporary <coughs> resonance and have the potential to shed light on our present day discussions. Uh, now, Dr. Scarantino has already mentioned that recent years have seen this globalizing trend in the study of the ancient worlds, where scholars are taking this increased interest in the cross-cultural comparative uh, study of civilizations. And that's not just in the area of philosophy, but in mathematics and medicine, literature and art, for example. And I think compared with the literature from about half a century ago, where we tend to see these broad sketches of uh, similarities and differences drawn between the East and the West, I think now scholars are uh, actively, actively reflecting on the concept of comparative philosophy itself and the methodology of comparison and paying close attention to the socio-historical and the intellectual backgrounds uh, in an attempt to avoid buying into apparent similarities and differences. 
And I'd like, I'd like to end by sharing with you a poem by the renowned 11th century Chinese poet Su Shi on uh, knowing and perceiving. Viewed horizontally arranged, a cliff from the side. It differs as we move high or low or far or nearby. We do not know the true face of Mount Lu because we are all ourselves inside. I like this poem because it, I think it encapsulates very well the difficulties involved in knowing and finding out the essence of things. Because of the multifaceted nature of the things we encounter and because of our limited viewpoint. So neither the insider nor the outsider knows the true face of Mount Lu because neither of them get the whole picture. And I think the scholar Zhang Longxi is right in saying that this poem is not about gaining the right view of the mountain. But what's required is a collaborative effort and an integration of different viewpoints and perspectives. So nobody is free from his or her own assumptions and conceptual schemes, and there's no objective view as such. But we can, what we can aim for is broadening our horizons in order to get a more holistic view of the mountain and of our uh, universal cultural heritage. Thank you. Well, I too want to begin by thanking uh, Professor uh, Victor Gomez Pin, the uh, Casa Asia, and the Confucian Institute here in Barcelona, and all of the many people uh, who have contributed to making the 13th International Ontology Congress in San Sebastián uh, here in Barcelona, and next week in A Coruña, uh, such a success. Although my career as an historian of uh, mathematics uh, actually began with a focus on modern mathematics. The first book I published was by Harvard University Press in 1979, followed by a book on uh, the, well, this was about Georg Cantor and transfinite set theory. I then wrote a biography of Abraham Robinson, the inverse of that, you might say, because he was the developer of non-standard analysis, a rigorous theory of infinitesimals. And then most recently, in uh, 2017, I collaborated on a book that's devoted to a history of fuzzy logic. So, in 1987, my career took an almost 180 degree turn, and how, you may well ask, uh, did this come about? This is the turn that it took, namely uh, towards the East and to China. And the transition, um, which as you can see, I was very happy to make, uh, began in 1987 on my first trip to China under the auspices of the US National Academy of Sciences and the Chinese Academia Sinica. This was all thanks to the venerable Chinese scholar of Chinese and European intellectual history, He Zhao Wu, who invited me to Tsinghua University in Beijing after we had met uh, while he was a visiting scholar at Columbia University in New York City. Um, he had a particular interest in the scientific revolution. I was teaching a seminar on the scientific revolution. Professor He asked if he could sit into my seminar. Within a week, he was my best student. And we started meeting weekly over lunch. At the end of that, he said, you should come to China. And I said, yes, I should. Now I forgot about it. And then six months later, I received this invitation to go to Beijing. And in Beijing, uh, my home, uh, beginning in the spring of 1988, uh, was in the Yu Song Yuan Bingguan uh, guest house on an old hutong uh, near the Institute for History of Natural Sciences. And my sponsor was, in fact, the institute there. <coughs> The director then was uh, Professor Xi Tsitsong, an historian of Chinese astronomy, and at that point the director of the institute, sorry, that's Xi Tsitsong, uh, the director of the institute, and uh, on the right is uh, the vice director of the in institute, an historian of modern biology, Li Pei Shan. I, of course, was interested in the historians of mathematics. And I was fortunate to join the institute's seminar on the history of mathematics led by Professor Du Charan, he's in the upper left. Uh, I then got to know Professor Guo Shuchun, he's the uh, world's leading authority on Liu Hui and the nine chapters on uh, the art of ancient mathematics in China, and then Liu Dun. And Liu Dun is the figure in the, the bottom center. Uh, he's my own contemporary, but as he once told me, uh, the biggest difference between you and me, Joe, is that I spent 10 years of my life as a cowboy during the Cultural Revolution in Inner Mongolia. 
but it's true. He was very well trained as an historian of mathematics, and I developed a great deal of respect for these people in the uh, six months that I was in China, and I came away uh, realizing that I wanted to do more. I couldn't have had three better teachers in Beijing, but then I went to Inner Mongolia Normal University, and at uh, Neymar Gusher Fantashui, I met Li Di. And Li Di was one of the uh, great masters of ancient Chinese mathematics as well. Uh, here you see him at home uh, in Hulahat uh, with his own private collection of rare Chinese mathematical books. So in short, uh, I was amazed and impressed by the uh, seriousness of their work and soon found myself studying both the language and the mathematical history of ancient China. Little did I know that uh, over the next 25 years, uh, our understanding of ancient uh, Chinese mathematics would grow and change dramatically thanks to the work of archaeologists and previously unknown uh, texts and artifacts related to mathematics that uh, since then have been unearthed. Now, until recently, uh, the earliest work of ancient Chinese mathematics was an edition of the nine chapters from the Southern Song Dynasty, uh, printed in 1200 AD. But recent archaeological discoveries have changed this situation dramatically. And in a way, this begins in 1974, at least on the world stage, when the uh, farmers uh, digging a well, actually, in an um, uh, area near Xi'an, discovered a terracotta figure. This was soon found to be the site of the mausoleum of the first Qin emperor, Qin Shi Huang. Uh, according to the historian Sima Qian, uh, work started in 246 BCE, and it took 700,000 workers to build this tomb. It consists in part of 8,000 life-size warriors of the tomb itself, only about one-tenth of the two million square meters of the entire site has so far been excavated. So you can imagine what lies ahead, just in terms of the archaeological discoveries that are likely to be made as more of this site is studied. Meanwhile, archaeologists in the of past century or so, and especially recently, have brought many remarkable objects and texts to light that have greatly changed our understanding and appreciation of ancient Chinese mathematics. In 1934, for example, at Sidan Ku, uh, near Changsha in uh, Henan province, a pre-Qin silk manuscript was unearthed, uh, brought to the United States in 1946, when it was exhibited at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. In 1965, Arthur M. Sackler uh, bought the document and entrusted it to the Freer Museum in Washington, D.C., where it was enhanced using infrared technology, and the Chu Silk Manuscript deals with astronomy and astrology and the computation of auspicious days. Part of the text of this manuscript uh, reads as follows. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but one part of it says, if the numbers aren't right, the seasons will be irregular and, and this is the part that interests me, the sun, the moon, the planets will erratically overstep their paths. It almost sounds like Heraclitus. Almost exactly the same passage you can find almost word for word. You really wonder what the uh, communicating is between these two very different philosophies in a way that the language and the basic idea turns out to be quite similar. The Chu Silk uh, manuscript makes it clear that mathematics was at the core of a harmonious and properly ordered cosmos. We'll return to this idea a little bit later. 1972 to 1974, at Ma Wangdui, again in Henan, the tombs of Li Sang, his wife, and presumably their son were unearthed and produced thousands of uh, cultural relics. Here you can see the excavation of the tomb of the Marquise and of the Marquis, which dates to about 186 BCE, uh, but was looted, unfortunately. Uh, the third tomb is that of a 30-year-old male, uh, presumably of their son. And here's a tablet coming from the tomb that establishes the burial date of 168 BCE. Tomb one of the Marquis contained an extraordinary outer coffin. Here's the inner coffin. And yet a third uh, magnificent coffin inside of that, in which lay, in repose, the famous Marquise herself, the miraculous Lady of Dai. Also found in the tomb was a prescription for immortality, uh, not unusual considering the extraordinary state of preservation of her body. Um, this all is reflected in the remarkable state of preservation of Lady Dai herself. Also found in the tomb is a silk painting of a banquet 
and from tomb three, 40 paintings and manuscripts on silk, bamboo, and wood, including the Joe E. or Book of Changes. Works of numerological significance relating to, relating to the uh, yin and yang, uh, as well as works on history, politics, economics, military affairs, as well as physical training and exercise, and material related to literature, philosophy, astronomy, and medicine. Military matters are also affected by the mathematics. Uh, directly related here are the famous Ma Wanhui maps depicting the kingdoms of Changsha and Nanyue, uh, part of what's today Vietnam. Uh, this is an important um, text for uh, astrology, uh, astrology and astronomy. Uh, it's a work on divination with 250 or so drawings of meteorological phenomena, clouds, rainbows, stars and comets, Wei Xing. Wei Xing means broom star. And the images you can see make clear why it's referred to as brooms. Note the caption that these record the names of each comet along with their divinatory significance. Each comet is uh, described briefly as death of the prince, for example, or the coming of plague, or three years of drought. 1975, at Choi um, Di, the tomb of a Qin Dynasty administrator was excavated. And one book on Qin Dynasty laws <laughs> includes material on mathematics, especially related to the computation of exchanges of various uh, commodities. So it's very important for the history of mathematics in this early period. It's similar, in fact, to chapter two that we find on uh, uh, grain exchanges in the classic Chinese mathematical work, the nine chapters on the art of mathematics. And it's important for interpreting part of the mathematical work that was discovered in 1983 at Zhang Jiashan. Again, the tomb of a Qin provincial administrator, books on legal statutes, medicine, uh, and mathematics. Also in this tomb, a book on laws and decrees of the second year of the Dowager Empress Lu Ho dates this material to about 186 BCE. For historians of mathematics, this is the earliest work devoted exclusively to mathematics from a dated, excavated context. There are about 200 bamboo slips containing 68 different mathematical problems relating to arithmetic and geometry. The original editor of the Swan Shu Shu, Peng Hao, translates the title of this as Book on Arithmetic. But I prefer to translate it as Book on Numbers and Computations. And here on this uh, bamboo strip on the upper left, you see what is taken to be the title of the book itself. In 1993, at Guodian, in the Hebei province again, a warring state's tomb of a scholar and teacher about 300 uh, BCE, uh, unearthed some 800 bamboo slips, including the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu and the Classic of Rites. Harvard sinologist at Tu Wei Ming has likened this discovery to the Dead Sea Scrolls with respect to its importance for the history of Chinese philosophy. In 1996, at Tsoma Lo, uh, again in Hunan province, uh, during the construction of a shopping mall, an ancient well uh, was found to contain 100,000 bamboo slips, official documents from the Wu Kingdom in particular, which dates it to about uh, 220 to 280 uh, contemporary area CE. These include uh, material related to land taxes, tax systems, various rules and regulations that help to shed additional light on mathematical practices of the uh, ancient Chinese bureaucrats. <laughs> One of these uh, Qin bamboo documents from 2002, from another uh, location, but again an ancient well, uh, discovered as a hydraulic engineering uh, power station was under construction in Longshan County in Hunan province. 30,000 uh, bamboo strips in this well related to political, economic, military, and social events, plus day-to-day -day records from about 220 to 280 uh, BCE. Uh, including a multiplication table. This is on a wooden board, and I'll come back to the multiplication table in a minute. And then in 2007, in December, the Yale Academy of Hunan University purchased more than 1,300 bamboo and some wooden slips uh, from an antiques dealer in Hong Kong. These include daily records, books of dreams, books on laws and ordinances, and one document in particular related to mathematics. This was first preserved and studied by a team of archaeologists at the Yuelu Academy. 
and the academy is one of the oldest and the most uh, venerable in China. In 2010, the academy organized a meeting of scholars to discuss the shoe. And here you can see, among other scholars that went to this meeting, a Christopher Cullen on the far left. He was then the director of the Needham Institute, and on the far right, second from the right, is Karin Shemla, uh, the uh, well-known historian of Chinese mathematics from CNRS in Paris. This gives you some idea of the state of these bamboo slips when they were first discovered. But once they're cleaned and treated, they become remarkably legible. Here, uh, what is taken to be the title of the work, a uh, shoe or number, or numbers, uh, is again found in the back of one of the bamboo slips. One problem in this collection refers to the 35th year of the reign of the first Qin Emperor. So this dates it to about 212 BCE, <coughs> slightly earlier than the Swan Shu Shu that we saw earlier. And I'm going to come back to the Shu and what it contains about mathematics in a moment. 2008, Tsinghua University acquired a collection of 2,388 bamboo slips. These have been radiocarbon dated to about 305 to 30 BCE from the Warring States period. The entire lot was again purchased from a dealer in Hong Kong, so we have no uh, provenance uh, for any of this material. But it's under the care of Professor Li Shui Qin at the Tsinghua Center for Excavated Texts, uh, Research and Preservation, and these relate primarily to uh, the Shangshu, the book of the Shang Dynasty. And here you see how carefully the researchers at Tsinghua have been working on these materials. The donation was supposed to have been an anonymous alumnus, but the Guanming Daily, as you can see here, gave it away when it revealed that the donor was Zhao Wei Guo, a wealthy alumnus, when it announced Tsinghua's acquisition of the material. Tsinghua did not publish any of this material in 2014, worried about suggestions that it might, in fact, constitute a series of very cleverly carried out forgeries. But one document that has been widely discussed is a previously unknown text, the Bao Shu, uh, the Bao Shun, uh, which purports to be a deathbed admonition by the King of Zhou to his son. Now, for historians of mathematics, uh, the most remarkable thing of the Tsinghua Bamboo collection is actually a set of 21 strips that provide an entire multiplication table of the nine nines from nine times nine uh, down to one half times one half. Uh, this was reported at the International Congress for the History of Science, uh, Medicine, and Technology at um, Manchester in uh, 2013 uh, by uh, Feng Li Sheng, an historian of mathematics at Tsinghua University. So uh, Li, um, uh, Feng Lisheng uh, made this material available in a lecture that he gave at the International Congress in 2013. That was later published uh, in a short version in Nature that, uh, that, that same year. And this is exactly uh, what the uh, bamboo uh, multiplication table set out in a matrix form looks like. Left to right, there's a strip for each of the uh, various multiplications you may want to carry out, beginning with one half, one, two, three, etc. Then moving from bottom to top, you get the multiplications. One half times one half would give you, give you one quarter down in the lower right hand, uh, left hand part of this matrix. And you can read the entire multiplication table off of this extraordinarily uh, constructed uh, matrix of the multiplications. So if you uh, go up to the um, uh, fifth row, for example, you come to the multiples of four uh, by uh, the fraction one half, one, two, three, four, and if you can read the Chinese numbers, they read perfectly straight across uh, the fifth row here. And what's also very interesting is that uh, although we know other mathematical tables from uh, wooden uh, tablets from the wells that we've seen earlier, for example, this is the only example we have of a matrix layout uh, on bamboo strips of this sort, and it's the only uh, example that we have that gives a unique character for one quarter in the uh, lower uh, left-hand multiplication of one half times one half. It's a little hard to make out here, but it is the um, uh, figure in the uh, lower extremity here. Now, in 2008, 3,346 um, uh, slips uh, were found, 
uh, at Beidou University, or actually <laughs> were obtained by Beidou University, in very well uh, state of preservation. Internal evidence suggests that they're from the um, Western or former Han Dynasty between 2002 and 9 uh, BCE, uh, most probably from the uh, reign of uh, Han Wu Di, which would place it about 142 87 BCE. Again, uh, these were from an undated, uh, from an un, uh, uh, dated, uh, trove of material that was bought on the antiques market, so it comes without a provenance. Perhaps the most remarkable feature of the Beida slips, and, and this is just a, a group of us that actually were privileged to go and see this material, uh, along with uh, Feng Lishan and the people at uh, uh, the university who were working on this material. Um, part of it has been uh, published recently by Han Wei uh, in a paper published um, in uh, Wen Wu. Uh, Part of the material actually deals with mathematics, and that's why it's of, of interest to me from the Beidou collection, uh, including certain strips that deal with divination and numerology. And a report of the Beidou uh, bamboo slips has been uh, published by Mark Talanowski as well, the French uh, historian of Chinese science in Tung Pao. Perhaps the most remarkable feature of the Beidou slips is this so-called uh, hemorrhological diagram. It's a uh, bright, brilliantly colored um, piece and it's a restored version, identifying various parts of the human body uh, related to various uh, divination practices that Don Harper, um, the historian of uh, Chinese science at the University of Chicago, has discussed in his analysis of the medical treatises from uh, Ma Wang Dui. So having very quickly <coughs> surveyed this uh, mounting, uh, amount of archaeological evidence, what can we actually begin to say now about the mathematical contents that come out of these works that I've been talking about? The earliest collection, yet known, devoted to mathematics, is the Shu. And recall that from internal uh, references uh, to the reign of the uh, Qin Emperor, this dates it to about uh, 212 BCE. Now, one problem in particular is of interest because it's not included in its near contemporary, the Swan Shu Shu. Although about 450 years later, these kinds of problems do turn up in the nine chapters in the art of mathematics. And these are namely problems related to Go Gu, or the right triangle, uh, and problems related to right triangles, and including uh, the understanding in China of what we would call the Pythagorean theorem, or there is the Go Gu uh, theorem. The problem uh, comes across in two uh, bamboo slips in one respect here, because um, it concerns a circular log buried in the ground, uh, cutting to one sun uh, into the log, which produces a quarter of one shirt. Same problem is going to occur in the nine chapters as well. Although the problem asks for the circumference of the log, the answer is only uh, is given uh, in terms of the diameter. And here, notice that the text reads G U A. It says, I'll get back to why this is interesting in a moment. A little less than 500 years later, after these bamboo uh, versions, um, Liu Hui, in his commentary on the nine chapters, treats a very similar problem. In fact, the dimensions are exactly the same as they appeared in the problem in the shoe a cut of one sun, a quarter of one shirt. But now the text refers specifically to a method. It says, Shu Yue. And the problem calls for the diameter, but only says that this may be obtained by multiplying half the chord by itself, then dividing by one and adding one to get the diameter. What's that about? This is virtually the same method that's prescribed in the shoe, but neither of these texts explains why or what the methodology is upon which these solutions are based. But Liu Hui, in his commentary on this problem, does. This is why the commentary is so valuable as an indicator of what the mathematician was actually thinking. Liu Wei's reference to the Go and the Xian make it clear that we're dealing here with the side and hypothesis of a right, the hypotenuse of a right triangle. And the solution is virtually the same as an earlier famous problem from the nine chapters, that of a reed growing in the center of a pond. The reed, gro reed grows to one sure above the water, when pulled to the side of the pond, it just touches the edge. The side of the square pond is one john, which is equal to ten sure. And except for a difference by a factor of ten, 
The dimensions and the numbers of both the log problem and the read problem are virtually the same, <coughs> as are the solutions. But why to solve the problem does Liu Hui say to square the go and then find the area of the gnomon? What's the gnomon here? What's that a reference to? Now this all relates to a fundamental method of ancient Chinese mathematics and is best understood in terms of a diagram by which the Chinese version of the Pythagorean theorem or the Gogu theorem may be proved. But before proving the Gogu theorem, which is represented in this diagram, let me tell you just briefly what that principle is. It's the in-out complementary method applied as in the example here. And the question is, under what circumstances can you say that these two areas, A and B, are equal? Well, if you're a mathematician, uh, you know that the answer involves the diagonal. And if these meet at a point on the diagonal, then the out-in complementary principle works as follows. The diagonal clearly divides the rectangle into two equal parts. Now, consider the lower inner rec the rectangle the diagonal divides this into two equal parts, which may, re may be removed. Similarly, the upper inner rectangle is divided into two equal parts, which may also be removed. Equally familiar in the Euclidean geometry is subtracting equals from equals. The remains are equal, and therefore we have the conclusion. We can now apply this to the uh, problem of the Pythagorean theorem. How does this help us to prove the Gogu theorem in the Chinese context? We begin with the two areas, the squares, the go and the gu, the shorter and the longer sides of the right triangle and the lower left parts of the diagram, and the upper, uh, the, the upper left and the lower right. And now we literally look at the outside parts, the parts that are outside the overlap with the square on the hypotenuse. And if we simply take the outside parts and move them in, we finally have a visual proof, very nicely, of the Pythagorean theorem, or in its Chinese context, the Gogu theorem. This has prompted, uh, in fact, Frank Sweats and T. Uh, Kao, his translator, to pose the important <coughs> question, was Pythagoras Chinese? We won't go into all this now, but I think actually both the Chinese and the Pythagorean results share a common origin in the practical experience of land surveyors, like these Egyptian Harpidonopti, or land surveyors, using knotted ropes to measure tracts of land. And it's surely no coincidence that both the Greek term hypotenuse and the Chinese term xian both relate to cords or strings that are drawn apart to measure or determine the length. But how does this help us now with the problem of the buried log or the reed in the pond problems? In the case of the reed, the total length of the reed is the hypotenuse. The height of the reed above the water is the xian minus gu, c minus b. And now we can see how this translates into a gnomon two red and green parts surrounding the yellow square uh, of the uh, diagram. So here's the diagram. Here's translating it into a square with a gnomon around it. And you can simply uh, go through Leo Wei's uh, derivation of the solution to see exactly how the gnomon leads us to the result. And we can then apply this uh, same reasoning in the case of the log in the wall problem translates directly uh, into how the ancient Chinese mathematicians would have thought about the solution to this problem. The only difference is that we're dealing with a Gogu triangle this time, with sides and hypotheses that are about one half those of the right triangle that figured in the read problem. So the dimensions are a little different, but the methodology of solving it is the same. We begin by squaring the Go, then calculating uh, with the Gnomon as before, and then by adding the depth to the cut, the diameter has been computed, and in uh, complete generality, we have the results of the theorem. So this is how the ancient Chinese would have approached these particular problems. And another important category uh, that comes into play here in the um, uh, Shu uh, document is the calculation of volumes. And these also are problems that come up in a very important part of the nine chapters itself. I'm not going to follow the details here, but simply indicate the variety of the solids that are considered, like walls or tunnels, the truncated pyramid, 
Uh, Chinese mathematicians approach these problems by breaking down the volumes into standard components whose volumes uh, were known and then could readily be used to uh, compute the volumes of the uh, larger figures. And these basic building blocks were, in fact, the cube, uh, the Chengdu, or prism, and the Yangma, or the square-based pyramid. The Shu also includes a problem on the volumes of a truncated cone, uh, but I'm not going to go into that here. What about the mathematics in the Suan Shu Shu, dating to 186 BCE? Here, problem 53 is given the area of a square field, you're asked to find the length of its side. And this is a problem uh, in determining a square root. How does the Suan Shu Shu go about doing this? The method may come as something of a surprise. It uses the method of excess and deficiency to approximate the root. If the root were 15, the area would be too small. If it were 16, it would be too large. So the square root must be somewhere between the two. Now forward to the nine chapters and Leo Hui's commentary on a very similar problem. But now Leo Hui provides a very precise algorithm by which the square root of any number may be computed. And you can see from the diagram that illustrates the procedure exactly what's going on here. The key conceptually is reflected in this diagram, reconstructed by the mathematician Dai Zhen for the Ming Encyclopedia Yongle Dagian, about 1403 to 1408. Problem 12 in chapter 4 of the nine chapters asks you to find the square root of 55,225. <coughs> it's a field um, of that area. Well, first it's observed that 200 squared is equal to 40,000, whereas 300 squared is equal to 90,000, and the square root must fall somewhere between the two. So, 200 squared gives you 40,000, remove that from the big square, and that leaves you with a gnomon that is 15,225. That's the white part um, uh, outside of the gnomon that is represented here. And then you go on, on to approximate the root going to the next digital place, and you eventually find that this is not uh, uh, a process that's going to go on forever. It's not an irrational number, but it's in fact a rational a square root, and you get an exact answer of 200, uh, uh, 2,325. So this, again, is a very graphic method as to how you can determine, using an algorithm, the square root of any given number. What the Swan Shu Shu um, did was to serve as a kind of textbook. It was a collection of problems given the uh, standard question answer answer method format. Uh, they were highly likely for students uh, that would use these um, with related scholars explaining to them the intricacies of the problems because the commentary, of course, is not a part of the text itself. How these might be used to teach students, I think, is made clear from three problems in particular. Problems 46, 47, and 48 are all interconnected in a way. And the first one um, seems to make absolutely no sense at all. You're carrying charcoal to a wagon, and then you're asked to deliver it to a specific location. And the question is, how much can be collected and delivered in one day? Now, as a group of mathematicians working on this problem at uh, Taiwan Normal University said, um, the meaning of this problem isn't clear. The next problem may help. It asks how many bamboo utensils can be made in one day if one first has to cut the bamboo and then make the utensils. And you're told how many uh, pieces of bamboo you can cut in a particular period of time, and then a solution is given to this problem. But when Guo Shu Rong of Inner Mongolia Normal University read this problem, he argued that the numbers must be wrong, and that either one of two changes had to be made to have the problem come out correctly. And Guo Shu Chun, the historian of mathematics at the Institute for Natural Science, History of Natural Sciences in Beijing, when he published his version of this problem, agreed, saying that, in fact, the numbers had to be changed, that the method given didn't work unless you changed uh, the numbers to have it come out properly. Peng Hao, the editor of the Suan Shu Shu, also argued that uh, this problem made no sense and that the wrong method was being used, and therefore, that's why the wrong answer turns up in the text. It had to be corrected. But in fact, if you go through the problem step by step, 
The problem is it's worked out in this one shoe shoe is absolutely correct. To cut one stalk of bamboo uh, it takes one sixtieth of a day. To make one luton takes one fifteenth of a day. So one stalk of bamboo suffices for three luton, which takes one six sixtieth plus three one fifteenths or thirteen sixtieth of a day. And then you go through the actual statement of the problem, it all works out perfectly fine. So now the question is, if the answer is correct, uh, where did Guo Shu wrong, Guo Shu Chun, and Peng Hao go wrong in their analysis of this problem? And this, I think, can be answered by looking at the third problem in this set. After you've discovered that this is correct, you've got to explain how they misinterpreted it. This is a feathering arrows problem. One person in one day can make 30 arrows, or he can put feathers on 20 arrows. If he does both in the same day, how many arrows is he going to produce? Um, that's the basic feathering arrows problem. You go through this problem, and what you discover is that the answer is you can simply provide a formula, as is done here, in one day, one person makes 30 arrows, or feathers 20, so that's 1 30th plus 1 20th. You add those together, it gives you an algorithm, and this is exactly the way you should solve the problem in all three of these cases according to the swan shoe shoe. So, the feathering arrows problem can now be explained to use both of the previous problems. And a clever teacher, I think, put the bamboo problem between the charcoal problem and the arrow problem because it has a twist that if the student isn't aware of, they'll apply that method from the feathering arrows problem incorrectly in the case of the bamboo problem. And so if we go back to the um, Luton problem, why doesn't this method work in the interpretations of Guo Shu Chun of uh, uh, Guo Shirong and um, uh, Peng Hao gave. Because the first thing you have to do is to cut five bamboo down to make the various luton. And so it's not an easy problem of just taking either feathering arrows or uh, making the arrows, and those are the two issues. You have a third aspect of this problem that has to be read into it. And once you've done that, you get exactly the right answer. And now we come to the the uh, futan, or the transporting coal problem. And that's exactly the same thing that's happening here. In one day, you can either gather coal, or in one day, you can move it to the gathering station, the collecting station. To put both of these together, you solve it exactly the way you would solve the feathering arrows problem. The only problem is in the gathering coal problem, it's not a very practical one. Because who would gather coal for part of a day, and then go to all the uh, effort to deliver it if you could gather coal over seven days and then deliver the whole thing at once to the uh, gathering station. So it's an impractical problem, but how often have you in a math course had a math problem that didn't necessarily make practical sense? The transmission of mathematics from individual problem texts to a formal classical text represents what I would say is the standardization or the bureaucratization that occurred in the Han Dynasty in the spirit of um, Wang Mang's standardization of weights and measures, and that's what this famous uh, uh, measuring device uh, represents. Mathematics, I would say, was also standardized in the nine chapters. And one chapter in particular was new in the nine chapters. It was a chapter devoted to matrix methods, uh, solutions of simultaneous uh, linear equations by a method that is um, equivalent basically to uh, Gaussian elimination. And there's another uh, important type of problem that was also not covered in the nine chapters uh, of uh, the art of mathematics, and that was the set of problems devoted to surveying involving the double distance method that Leo Hui said required an additional chapter to the nine chapters, and he wrote that additional chapter, eventually made a separate classic of its own known as the Haidao Swan Jing. Well, while recent archaeological discoveries over the past 50 years have greatly improved our appreciation of the development of mathematics in ancient China, our understanding of ancient Chinese science and technology in general 
has also been greatly transformed by the immense project launched half a century ago by Joseph Needham. For the history of Chinese mathematics, publication of volume three of the uh, Science and Civilization in China series marked a turning point. It was written by Joseph Needham with the help of his Chinese collaborator, Wan Ling. And Needham met Wan Ling, um, sorry, here's Wan Ling, met Wan Ling in China during World War II. He simultaneously arranged for Wan Ling to come to Cambridge University. There he eventually received his PhD from Trinity College while working with Needham on the early volumes of the Science and Civilization in China series. One of the most controversial evidence, uh, one of the most controversial elements of volume three on mathematics and astronomy was the diagram from the Zhou Bi Xuan Jing and a purported proof that it supposedly contained of the Gogu or Pythagorean theorem. Now at the time, an American graduate student, Arnold Koslow, was in Cambridge. He was also at King's. He was doing PhD in philosophy, but he'd also studied Chinese at Columbia University in New York, and he'd been put in touch with Joseph Needham. Needham invited Koslow to proofread volume two of the Science and Civilization in China series. He was impressed by the results. So here's Koslow with Wang uh, Hao, uh, well, Wang Ling, rather, in uh, 1956 at the International Congress for History of Science in Florence, Italy. However, as Chris Cullen notes in his translation of the Zhou Bi Xuan Jing, the diagram that Newton offered for this right uh, triangle theorem, the uh, Pythagorean theorem, in volume three was clearly wrong. The proof appears as part of a dialogue where the master explains what, um, must, what some people have taken to be a proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And here's the argument presented by uh, Shan Gao in a translation that Needham credits to Arnold Koslow. The translation's at the top. But you can see, if you look at the diagram, the discrepancy at once. The diagram refers to an inner yellow square, and that little square in the middle says yellow. And off to the uh, left on the triangle, it says red square. There's no reference to a red or a yellow anything in the translated passage. Koslow, based solely on the Shangdao dialogue and not looking at the diagram that was published with the Zhou Bi Xuan Jing, reconstructed what he realized the argument must have been. And it's clear how greatly it demonstrates, or how neatly it demonstrates, the equivalence of the Gogu areas on the right with the hypotenuse area uh, as seen on the left here. This was the diagram that Koslow gave to Needham, along with his uh, new translation. And both Needham and Wan Ling agreed that Koslow's translation was much better than the one they provided. And so Needham made a note to put this into the volume three of the Science and Civilization in China uh, book. Subsequently, Christopher Cullen, in an article written on the occasion of the International Congress of Mathematicians in Beijing in 2002, revisited this matter and came to the startling conclusion that Koslow had completely invented the proof and misread the original text entirely. Now, Arnold Koslow is a colleague of mine at the uh, Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He's in the PhD program in philosophy. So I asked Arnie about this. I said, Arnie, what's the story about the proof that you give in volume three of the Science and Civilization in China series? It's clearly the wrong diagram. He says, yes, I know it's the wrong diagram. And then he explained to me exactly how this came to be. He said that when he'd given Needham the text, they agreed the text was right, the text went in the revised version of the volume three. But Needham then said, I don't have enough money to change the diagram. So we're going to have to keep the old diagram. And as Car Arnold Koslow later summarized it, and so the new translation was printed with the old diagram. Volume three appeared in 1959. None of us was happy about this compromise, but Wang Ling liked the translation. Joseph was extraordinarily uh, generous in his praise. And it would appear in this uh, magnificent volume I felt at the time that people could easily reconstruct the diagram from the translation. Well, uh, that wasn't exactly the case. But what I think this last example demonstrates, I believe, is that while archaeological discoveries help us to improve and correct our understanding of ancient Chinese mathematics in China, even re recent excavations into the archives of the Needham Institute uh, help uh, to clarify situations as well. 
Thus, I'm grateful to John Moffat, librarian at the Needham Institute, um, who gave me access to the page proofs for the volume three. I was in Cambridge just two weeks ago in the library looking at those page proofs, and these are the documents. There is Coslow's original handwritten translation, and there is the diagram as he originally meant for it to be reconstructed in volume three. The historical records can be set straight by bamboo texts being pulled out of archaeological context, just as the historical record can be helped by excavating in archives of written materials, uh, even as recently as a couple of weeks ago. Having said that, I would say not a mas, or if I finish this lecture in Beijing, xie xie. And again, my thanks to Victor Gomez Pin and to Casa Asia and the Confucian Institute here in Barcelona. Thank you. Yo tengo dos preguntas. Ah, ah, muy bien. Una. ¿Quieres estar eh, allí con ellos? No, no, no. Adelante, bueno, adelante. En realidad son tres. Bueno. Eh, dos de carácter más general y una más específica para la doctora Chao. Eh, ¿Las formularé en inglés? Sí, mejor. No se ahorra con la traducción. Uh, what do you think are the reasons for the difference between uh, Eastern and Western philosophy? Is a geographic uh, reason? Thank you for the question. Um, it's a very, very big question um, that rather reminds me of the, the Needham question. Um, So uh, Joseph Needham, which Professor Dalbin has just mentioned, who compiled the um, Science and Civilization series, in China series. Um, so he famously posed the question of why um, uh, modern science did not arise in China, but in the West. And much along the same vein, I think, the answer to both these questions Um, need to take into consideration a variety of factors, um, not just geographical, but the socio-historical background, the uh, political situation at the time, how um, what the intellectual scene was like, um, how the philosophers interacted with one another from the same tradition, and also with external influences. So I'm afraid. I don't think there's one, one factor that's um, led to this uh, divergence in the thought, but it's very much a um, the philosophers um, reacting to the situations they were in. So, for example, in 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 the Warring States period in China, um, there was a real sense of there uh, there was going to be a universal monarch. Um, who would rule, um, and that's what uh, the philosophers debated about, you know, what this universal ruler, what kind of virtues he should um, <coughs> embody. Whereas in, in, in the Greek uh, city-states, there were a variety of um, uh, in uh, political institutions, um, and so that necessarily affected the ways that people view, view the political situation and how they conceive of political organization, just as an example. And the other question? Maybe you can make the two questions together. Well, yeah. only one. Okay. Uh, 
Is there any relationship between the uh, Chinese word Ren and uh -huh. the um, Japanese uh, name Ren meaning lotus flower? Uh, the Japanese word <laughs> meaning flower. Lotus flower, Ren. A lotus Ren. flower. Oh, okay. Um, not that I'm aware of, but perhaps other specialists in the audience can correct me. Um, Are you aware of this distinction? No. Hmm. Do you Probably. have any clue? Well, My, I, I thought yeah. probably it could be a cosmological uh, concept. Is it uh, just the, pronun uh, the, the pronunciation or the character? It's not the character. The character is not the same, is it? So it's just the pronounce. So I think my inclination was saying that they are unrelated, but yeah. Very general question, very naive question. If you talk about the root of mathematics, that's a question. For example, Aristotle, the priest in Egypt were a very good mathematician because they were free of walking. <laughs> but uh, it's the same question. The root of mathematics and the root of science. What do you think about it? Mathematics is science. Well, it's interesting to think about the nature of mathematics and its relationship to the other sciences, whether you're talking about the Egyptians, the Greeks, or the Chinese. Um, the Chinese clearly, like the Egyptians, Mesopotamians, were very practical people and had very practical reasons for wanting to develop their mathematics. We also don't know a great deal about how it was actually transmitted. We know that there were individuals who were prized as mathematicians, but we don't know anything about the personal lives, really, of people like Liu Hui, except that they seem to have master-student relationships, and we have dialogues that have teachers presenting problems and solutions to their students. Um, but the Greeks developed an entire uh, philosophy of mathematics, if you will. It wasn't just about finding techniques that would give you solutions to problems that were well known. And in fact, if you look at what the great accomplishments of Greek mathematics were, finding the uh, volume of a pyramid or the volume of a sphere which require infinitesimal methods quite remarkable and quite advanced what Archimedes for example uh, achieves. If you remember 10 years ago at Casa Asia I spoke about this problem the infinite in mathematics east and west and about four years ago I was giving a lecture at the Fairbanks Center at Harvard University and I pointed out that the methods that Archimedes had used to find the volume of the sphere involved the intersection of two cylinders, producing what's mathematicians called the bicylinder. And that if you look at the solution in China, Liu Hui was only able to get so far with the, with the solution. <coughs> he managed to figure out the volume of the intersection of the, the bicylinders, but not for the sphere itself. And one mathematician, a Chinese mathematician in the audience said, well, that means that the Chinese must have known about Archimedes. I'm not so sure. Because when mathematicians are dealing with a given problem, like the rope structures, if you're a land surveyor in ancient Egypt, you discover pretty quickly that three, four, five always gives you a right triangle. Same thing in China. If you are doing any kind of elementary mathematics, you will discover fairly quickly certain numbers give you right angles. It's perfectly possible these results could have been generated quite independently. The one thing that happens in ancient uh, Greece, and I have a great ongoing debate with Karin Chemba, for example, in, in Paris about this. What did the Greeks discover about the diagonal of the square? That it led to an incommensurable magnitude, and you have whole dialogues in Plato devoted to the extraordinary discovery, the third numbers that are not rational. And this is one reason why I think the Greeks developed their axiomatic method and the whole you know, armature to go around mathematics was to handle this problem acute for Greek mathematics because there were certain things 
that seemed to have no numbers, but geometry did have lengths. We don't get into any of that in China, which I think is a pretty good argument for the fact that the Chinese weren't concerned about things like incommensurable magnitudes. The word, when you have a number that for the Greeks would be incommensurable or irrational, is simply bukakai. It doesn't end. It keeps on going. Well, one third keeps on going. So that's not enough to prove that they appreciated what irrational or incommensurable magnitudes were like. However, all these have very obvious applications in many day-to-day -day transactions, and it's there in the practical carrying out of these things that I think most of the bureaucrats, very few who were using this mathematics, uh, would have applied it. But I think people like Liu Hui, they're more maybe the, the, the philosophical type. They want to find a more universal method, yeah, an algorithm will apply to a whole body of cases. So there may have been individuals in China that had more specific or what we might call philosophical interests in the mathematics they were doing. But by and large, most of them were simply concerned with how much mathematics they needed to know to carry out the business of the, the day. It wasn't embedded in a whole philosophy the way it was in, in Greece. I'm sure that doesn't answer your question, um, but maybe it's a step in a direction. I have another question. First thing is of Greece are called by Aristotle himself all physical. They were physical. And philosophy comes in later. And uh, they were thinkers in China analogous to those in the old China, to those physical That is the thing. Because what Aristotle is saying is that uh, all was convinced that there is an unkey nature. That is why physics was possible. And my question is if it, there is some type of analogous in the old science. I think the question is interesting um, because it <coughs> challenges us to think about what we mean by the, the physical. It's starting, I guess, from a, um, the question starts from the ancient Greek perspective and then asks whether there are equivalents. Um, I think there are certainly philosophers who, in China, um, throughout different periods, who are interested in, uh, in physical phenomenon, let's say. Um, there are um, examples of philosophers like Zhang Zai, um, that's, uh, uh, who falls in the Neo-Confusionism uh, category period, who talks about uh, the qi, uh, so this uh, vital energy, or, uh, it's very difficult to, to translate into English, um, and it does have various translations, uh, that analyzes the role that qi plays uh, in the world. So in a way, the approach is different from the ancient Greeks, but there are considerations of humans' uh, relationships to the physical world. There are different concepts of nature, so to say. Um, some have commented that the Chinese don't have this universal idea of uh, uh, fusis. Uh, there's no equivalent of fusis in China, but there are various different concepts. That it's not a concept analogous to the anarchy of the I suppose Tao would be the equivalent. Uh, I mean, there's a line in the Tao uh, Te Ching in the Laozi that 
factors. Um, L produces one, one produces two, uh, two produces three, and three produces the myriad of things. So in a sense, it's Tao that gives rise to, to everything. And you can say it, it is a metaphysical concept, I suppose, um, in terms of how you interpret it. Uh, and even though you know we talk about the Taoists who um, tell us what we should do to pursue the Tao, actually um, other so-called philosophical schools are also uh, discussing the right Tao. Mm. Uh, as uh, Dr. Escarantino said before, the Congress, the Congress showed them that it's not longer possible to study the philosophy only with the Western view. In your opinion, how you can change the, this pattern, that uh, this, this form of view, this philosophy? Uh, how I can change this um, situation? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I think when it concerns institutions, it's always difficult to change to a particular direction. So uh, on a pessimistic note, I think there are still very few philosophy departments um, in the West, in, 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 in the UK and Europe, that offer uh, courses that include um, Asian philosophy in their philosophy departments. And say Chinese philosophy would only be studied in the East Asian department, for example. So that is the still sadly the case. Um, but on the other hand, I think there are courses and events and conferences like this that are uh, now appearing. Um, so on a less uh, formal structure, um, and I think that can be said for all over the world actually. So there have been uh, summer schools in Berlin. There was a summer school a few years ago on globalizing classics that had various courses that took a comparative approach to this topic, to various topics. And then there were um, summer schools in Budapest in the Central European University on what makes us human comparative perspectives. Uh, and not to mention the many, many courses in, in, in China as well. Um, so um, I think in terms of the, these um, conferences and events, and in terms of publications as well in this area, we can really see a move towards that direction, towards a comparative perspective, just, I think, over the past five years or so. So, say, when I started my PhD, um, I think there were very few uh, occasions where we could uh, have this cross-cultural dialogue uh, on a topic of common interest across uh, dif disciplines and with academics from different departments. But I think that's uh, slowly changing. And I guess on a personal level, um, um, so what, what we can do as individuals, I suppose it's taking that leap of faith and um, <coughs> starting to learn more about other cultures. And even if you can't use that in your own study just right at this moment. And I think just knowing about the different forms of, say, philosophy, science, religion, and different cultural traditions will inform your own study at some point in the future. It doesn't have to be comparative work at the outset right now, but it will um, change, I think, change the way you think fundamentally about the variety of issues. I would say just very briefly, if you're a professional philosopher, of course you want to know about philosophies everywhere. But let's face it, most of the world does not consist of professional philosophers. So why do you want to know about anything? Um, in the West, we've grown out of a tradition that goes all the way back to the Greek. So to teach Greek philosophy in most Western schools makes sense. But let's say you're a businessman or you're a sociologist or a political scientist and you're dealing with China. You need to know why Chinese people think and behave the way they do. And if you don't know anything about the history of Chinese philosophy, you probably won't get that right. And as the world becomes more cosmopolitan and mixed with people from all parts of the world, um, you may want to know why the people living next door to you 
uh, do the things they do and think the way they do, and part of that might involve getting to know something about Chinese philosophy. I'm a great believer in you learn something when you need it. And when my students try and learn Spanish um, you know, in school in New York City, if they know some neighbors that speak Spanish, that's the best way to learn it, better still come to Spain. Then you have to know it. So I think you learn things when you need it. And increasingly, I think, in the modern world, we need to understand why Chinese people think the way they do. The same we need to know about how Japanese people or people from India think, if you really want to understand both their culture and how we interact with them. So I think, you know, that's my take on how, how you might answer that question. Yeah. What, one, last, one last question, very easy. Uh, oh, they're always the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are celebrating this year the 400th anniversary of the death of uh, Diego de Pantoja, who died uh, in uh, 1618, and who was a great uh, mathematician and uh, he was an expert also in astronomy, a priest, a uh, Jesuit, and he was the first Occidental to enter in the Forbidden City in 601. It's too bad that Professor Escarantino left because many people believe that it was uh, Matteo Ricci, but he, he entered in the Forbidden City with Matteo Ricci both together. Uh, so we have many, ex we know that many uh, priests from uh, Spain, from Italy, from Portugal, went to China in the 17th century. But uh, do you have any knowledge of uh, some Chinese that uh, arrived in, in uh, Greece or in Europe in, uh, in that time? Or it was only one way, they, even if they had the, the Silk Road uh, after that. I don't know if you have any knowledge of this uh, exchange of uh, knowledge and, and people. I know there were some, but I, I can't be specific. Zheng He is a well-known uh, yeah. 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 Uh, the, the great you know, admiral and, and explorer to, who led as far as Baba Dushu, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but were there actually Chinese that came and lived in Paris or London and, mm -hmm. and did in the West what the Jesuits were doing? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the Chinese had no interest in proselytizing the way the Jesuits were really trying to convert. Sorry, um, I mean, Jesuits had a mission, and that was to convert the Chinese to Christianity. And so mathematics was part of it, astronomy was very much a part of it. And we have uh, appeals from Matteo Ricci saying, I need more astronomers coming because the Chinese really want to know about this. Um, they weren't so impressed with Euclid when Matteo Ricci and Zhu Guangxi published that originally in the first six books. Um, and then the Jesuits gave a very confused record of Western astronomy because they couldn't talk about it. Copernicus and Galileo easily. So they presented sort of the Tychonic version of the, the, the cosmology. And then when they finally were able to talk about Copernicus, the Chinese were just amazed. They said, well, first you said everything's around the Earth, and now you say it's going around the sun. First you said going in circles, now it's ellipses. It's all very confusing. And so there was no physical evidence for any of this <laughs> until the 19th century, the discovery of parallax and the, the focal pendulum and things like that. No wonder the Chinese were skeptical of what the Jesuits were trying to do. So um, the Jesuits were there for a purpose, but I don't think the Chinese had a similar purpose in going to Europe for any reason. And so we were just lucky that Marco Polo brought pasta back and things like that. Um, but I, I can't imagine that there were any Chinese with a similar mission that the Jesuits had. I think that itself provides a topic for comparison, actually, just what the motives were for going out there and what, 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 what they're trying to achieve. The Jesuits are remarkable because they're they're an organized body of people. Um, uh, why, yeah, we don't based on the on faith. Well, some die, most probably died in China. Actually, very few actually came back. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary area of study. What you do find are Chinese going to India, and I think you'll find Chinese in the Islamic world. And of course, there were people going along the Silk Route. We have. Roman artifacts in China and Chinese artifacts in, in Rome. So we know the material went. The material went, ideas were going, and some people must have made that trek. Um, and beyond that, I'm not in a position to say more. No more questions? 
Well, I think it's, uh, maybe it's time to, to finish. So thank you very much, Professor Bowen, Professor Tsao, Professor Romertini, and all of you.